All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for investing your time to learn more about uh, sustainable land care. My name is Fausto. Um, and uh, we have an exciting webinar with a lot of great content for everybody tonight. Um, the objective of these uh, webinar series is to uh, promote and educate uh, modern sustainable practices in organic land care and really provide um, key information to, to help companies, uh, crews, cities, municipalities transition to, to gas alternative methods, really for the benefit of uh, customers, communities, and, and workers. So the format today will be, uh, we're gonna have two 20 minute pre presentations followed by a Q and A. So if you can please, uh, I look for the uh, Q and A section in, in, the, in your Zoom window and you're, you're going to have the opportunity to um, ask any questions and we'll gladly direct those questions to either Dan or Richard. So today's speakers, uh, Richard McCoy uh, and Dan Mabe. Uh, Richard McCoy is the uh, founder of M M McCoy uh, Horticultural uh, since 1995. Uh, he is an ecological and organic uh, land care thought leader in the East Coast. Um, and he's been offering sustainable, responsible gardening, design and maintenance for a few decades now. Um, his projects have gone on to receive recognition from the uh, Smithsonian Institute Archives of American Gardens. He's also a member, council member for the uh, Organic Landscape Association and a uh, member of Rutgers Organic Land Care Working Group. So long list of achievements there. And uh, then we'll be, followed by Dan Mabe, my personal and dear friend. He's the uh, founder of uh, AGZA, the American Green Zone Alliance. Uh, nearly 20 years ago, he became the uh, main spokesperson for sustainable and zero emission land care movement utilizing uh, renewable energy. And since then, he's been training, uh, certifying companies, cities, commercial properties and crews. And he also spearheads uh, initiatives with uh, CARB, the California Air Resource Board, and the uh, AQMDs, the Air Quality Management Districts in California. So thank you, for Dan and Richard, for, for sharing this wonderful knowledge. And before we start with Richard, I'm just, we're just going to do a quick poll to uh, just understand where everybody's coming from. So please take two minutes just to help us with uh, these questions here and let me just share them. All right. Okay. So we'd love to just learn a little bit more about you. Awesome, thank you everybody for participating. And I will be sharing these results with, with you guys as well. And, uh, and now we're going to start with Richard. You're on mute, Richard.
Richard, you're on mute. Okay, when that happens, sorry about that. All right, thanks, Fausto. Appreciate that, and I uh, appreciate everybody for uh, taking the time out this evening to um, learn something new about some sustainable land care and the things that Dan and Ags are doing, and some of the things that we're doing in New Jersey. So. Um, basically, what my talk will be about this evening is really what is organic, ecological, and sustainable land care. And part of what, what we do is uh, recently is we took the we did take the access certification that Dan's going to talk about um, in a little bit. Um, so we are New Jersey's first certified Agza Pro service company, um, and we're pr pretty happy about that. Obviously, so we think that's a great thing. It really fits in with our with what we do as a company. Um, you know, Dan and his and his group were fantastic with the training they did. Um, to our company, we like to refer to Dan as the icon of lithium ion. Um, he's a wellspring of information, just loaded with uh, amazing stuff. So um, I'm sure you guys are going to learn a ton from him this evening, um, and also hopefully uh, you'll be speaking with him in the future about what Ags is doing and, and some of the some of the ways they can help you. Um, so here's our guys using our electric battery powered equipment, um, our 33 inch mean green watt behind our Husqvarna. Uh, string trimmers, we have backpack blowers and the pretty much run the gamut for electric uh, equipment, chains, et cetera. A little more background for context of uh, where I came from. Uh, 30 years in the industry, uh, as Fausto mentioned, we established in horticultural 95. And when we started, we started as conventional as most landscape contractors do. It's all synthetic chemicals. It's, um, you know, non-native plants. Um, a lot of not really paying attention to soil health and things of that nature. Um, all the things that conventional landscapes really do now is what we did. And in 2005, we pretty much went cold turkey and got away from all the synthetic applications as best we could, um, transitioned to native plants um, so we can bring in the ecological component to our landscapes. Um, and again, using just as uh, the past couple of years, we're dabbling in electric and we really put a, a major a major press on to uh, using electric and getting away from gas um, moving forward. Um, a, a little more background for context of some of the things that I've gotten into. Um, the Ecological Landscape uh, Alliance Speakers Bureau. Uh, Fausto mentioned the Organic Landscape Association. As a member of Rutgers Organic Land Care Working Group, um, I do have a certificate of land care through them. Um, Co-author of the Rutgers Organic Land Care Best Management Practices Manual, um, and and a few other things that that sort of lead us, my company, in the direction um, that we're trying to go. Um, and with the native plants, one thing we've done is we've partnered with Homegrown National Park, which is Doug Calmy's group, um, where they have a map where folks that are, are participating in this Homegrown National Park can actually get their native plant and native landscape um, on a map so we can start to build those plant communities that have been decimated by um, the, the construction that have gone over the past, you know. Uh, so if you're not in New Jersey, uh, that really doesn't matter. Organic land care can work anywhere. There are 10 components that would be what we call the core of organic land care, um, doing no harm, treating the landscape as a whole system, which is going to be the crux of what I speak about tonight, um, reducing energy, water, materials, promoting soil health, which is probably could be number one on the list. Um, and again, these core processes that we that we use will translate to any part of the country, really any part of the world. Um, and once you get into regionality of it, that's when you sort of drill down to the niche um, ecology of, you know, like a Southwest plant versus a Northeast plant. So um, those are the things you have to look into once you once you understand these 10 core components. Um, again, any, anywhere in the country, anywhere in the world, organic land care can work if, if, you're, if you're applying a practice. So what is land care versus landscape? Um, this, side, this slide sort of, to me, makes sense because people don't really understand the comparison between the two. So when you're doing organic land care, you're caring for the land, it's stewardship. It's, you know, again, native plants, bringing in pollinators, dealing with soil biology. Just because you're a landscape contractor and don't recognize land care, that doesn't mean you're doing the wrong thing. It just means you don't recognize it. You can be very good at what you do as a conventional landscape contractor. Your properties can and that can be exactly what the homeowner wants. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't care. It just means you don't recognize the things that we do in, in organic or ecological sustainable landscape. Um, it's a paradigm shift. When you start to look at things in, in this fashion, um, you remove 
the cause of the problem instead of spraying something on a, on a plant that has an issue, whether it has a scale issue or a lace wing or a lace bug issue. Those issues are usually caused by stress, which means that plant's in the wrong spot. It's either too sunny, um, too wet, whatever the case is. You know, and like Chip Osborne, uh, one of the great turf uh, mentors for a lot of us folks, um, you know, one of his great quotes is, you can't fix landscape problems in a bag from a bag, box, or bottle. Um, and it, that, that is very true. You need to treat the landscape as, like I mentioned, a living system and take the problems away and incorporate these things we're going to talk about. Not a product swap. Both sides, not a product swap. So you're not going to take organics and just pull a piece of conventional out and think that it's going to work. You have to incorporate the whole system, soil biology, um, you know, just all those things that we that we're going to be talking about. You know, calling in pollinators, that system. You have to build that system, build that ecological system, so that the you know you start to build those landscapes up in a in a more environmentally friendly way for these pollinators and these little insects and all these great things that happen on your property. Um, organic land care support, supports uh, the natural systems, right? Like we're talking about all the soil biology. There's billions and billions of soil biology that, that until 2005, I never even realized existed. You know, we used to put compost in the soil or, or manures in the soil. Why, why did we do it? Well, it was good for the soil. We didn't know why we were doing it in you know, 95 and beyond. We just did it because it was the right thing to do. 2005 when I took a, a, a NOFA class and I saw some slides of soil biology and what's actually happening under our feet, it really made me realize that that's where everything starts at the soil level and you go up from there. Um, again, native plants, we're talking about attracting uh, diver di uh, diversity. Um, the landscape, conventional landscape system, they go past, they bypass all the natural systems that, that are there for us to work with by using synthetic material. Um, too much nitrogen into turf is an issue. Obviously we have runoff. Um, all these things lead to stresses in plant material. Um, and again, we wanna remove those things so that we have, uh, can work with the natural. Um, one of the reasons why we switched to, of course is our team members. We didn't want our team members handling synthetic applications uh, and materials. So it gives everybody versus landscape you know, using synthetics, you have a greater risk of exposure to all the all the folks that are involved in it, whether it's the homeowner, whether it's uh, somebody walking a dog down the sidewalk and doesn't look at the little pesticide sign that's there. Most people don't even pay attention to them. Um, you know, the, the, the pet could be walking directly in a, a fresh application, you know, without the homeowner uh, paying attention, being aware of it. So those are sort of the side-by-side -side comparison of, of what the difference between organic land care, ecological land care is. So this is one of our properties, you know, the organic land care comes in a lot of shapes and sizes. Um, this one, when we renovated it, we, we did a total reno job of the back of the property. Um, 2,500 different types of plants, different sizes, 250 different species of native plants. Mostly, we like to deal with mostly um, species. We will use cultivars, um, but we, we strictly want to deal with species because um, the pollinators are, are more, more beneficial to the coal of pollinators instead of using something that's been um, This is not organic land care, right? This is your, your very typical uh, plastic landscape is Tony Lund from Princeton, uh, Princeton, Wyatt, Wyatt Princeton. He calls these plastic landscapes where it's artificial, right? So we're dealing with a 1960s landscape model. Everything's done just like it's a painting, right? Just like if you know we have something on the wall and it's inanimate, it doesn't do anything except you look at it. That's our 1960s model sort of promotes that, that lack of ecology in the landscapes because we're not using native plants, we're using synthetic herbicides. Um, there's zero, zero benefit to the ecology. And of course, the landscapes typically lead to excess So when I came up uh, in the industry, we were spraying our leaf canopies for leaf chewing and sucking insects with these hydraulic rigs. Now we've gotten away from that because we know now that when we're doing that, we're killing all the good biology on our landscapes. Um, this picture here is the underside of a uh, milkweed plant. It's got ladybug. Uh, it's got the orange, if you're not familiar, the orange are aphids. Ladybug larva on the right, which is the black and orange insect actually eating the um, the aphid and adult larvae and also the exoskeletons of the, uh, I'm sorry, the adult ladybug and the exoskeletons after they've molted. 
Pachyonoid wasps also parasitizing uh, the aphids, you know, other beneficial. That's why we don't need synthetics on our properties anymore. That's why we live in there. Over. This is organic land care. We reduce lawn systems, uh, uh, we reduce lawn areas and incorporate native plants in areas where we don't necessarily need lawn that aren't actively being used. And they come in all shapes and sizes. They don't have to be big elaborate landscapes. They can be small little backyard gardens. This actually in the distance is a rain garden. This is not organic land care. Uh, mulch volcanoes, I'm not sure where, where most of the folks are, but mulch volcanoes are a, are a big problem in our industry in the Northeast. Um, proper planting and pra maintenance practices being conscious of with organic land care. Um, right plant, right place. Again, that goes back to what I mentioned before. Oh, it's soil, not dirt. It took me a long time to figure this out. Um, and actually, I didn't get slapped in the face, but I was reminded multiple times in the 90s when I first started doing this. I used to call it dirt. I used to call it dirt. Dirt's what you get under your fingernails. Soil is what plants grow in. So it took, it takes quite a bit of that mindset changing to get it into your head that you have to look at things a little differently. Um, and when you have a active, healthy biological soil, this is what it looks like. It's loose and tribal, uh, the fine hair, uh, root tips going through it, the mycelium, the fungal hyphae, uh, et cetera, the white strands of the fungi um, just creeping through the soil and doing what they do. Um, Dr. Elaine Ingham, one of the leaders in, in soil biology, uh, you know, one of the things just the touching the surface is, you know, there's between a million and, and one billion bacteria in just a, in a productive soil. And this slide, this one slide here in particular, is one of the ones that really set me on my path to organics. Um, it's fungal hyphae that actually wrapping itself around a, uh, a, a, a nematode and strangling that nematode. And it's, you know, it'll ingest that you tell because of the bad nematodes are typically a little larger than plants. So this is the thing that really set me on my path and made us change our, our ways and realize that there's more than just things that are happening above the soil that, that made the soil is a major part, major component of what we're doing. You really need to pay attention to it. Um, just touching on organic lawns a little bit. Um, there's four really four ways that you can sort of break down organic lawns. Um, one being traditional programs, one being bridge programs, where you'll use a combination of organic and uh, synthetic to hopefully cross that bridge over to regenerative. Now, traditional programming and bridge programs do not affect soil biology. When you start to work, think about regenerative and organic systems, the difference is programs, you're talking about materials. Systems is you're working with the natural systems, like I mentioned earlier. That's the big difference. But you can start to transition to an organic program from traditional using bridge products to regenerative system where you're paying more attention to the soil biology and ultimately to an organic system where you've done the inputs of, of soil composting and you've done soil testing, alleviated compaction, um, alleviated problematic lawn areas, shady areas or wet areas where you're not gonna get grass to grow that, ha you know, that has um, the opportunity um, to have native plants. Right? So you're gonna swap out those, those problematic lawn areas um, to these native plant systems that we're trying to improve. Um, and that's an example of organic lawn, another example. Um, green infrastructure and native plants sort of go hand in hand. So if you're gonna plant a garden bed and you have access to being able to run downspout leaders out to a rain garden where you can capture that water, uh, you know, just quickly what a rain garden is, is where you, you capture that rain, where you dig a depression in the ground and capture the rainwater and let it percolate slowly into the ground instead of having to wash out into the street, down the gutter, into the sewer. Um, and, and back up the, the, the sewer, uh, stormwater management systems that municipalities has in place. Um, the benefit of this is really you're bringing a lot of diversity into the landscape. You're removing turf grass. Um, so you don't have those applications, organic or not. You don't have those applications going down on your lawns. Um, and this becomes a self-sustaining system. There is always a little bit of work as in any garden, you do need to go and do some weeding, making sure that you know the outflows aren't clogged up with debris um, and, and that sort of thing, but it's very, very easy maintenance once we're established. Um, this is also a rain garden. This particular rain garden is about 400 square feet, and over the course of five years, this rain garden will catch and capture over 2 million gallons of water and recharge the aquifer. Um, all this water coming off the house, which otherwise otherwise would be dumped into the, into the storm. Um, another, another large problem we have is, uh, along with proper planting and right, uh, right plant replaces, 
a lot of trees are dug in the nurseries improperly. So we need to we need to take some some soil off the top of those root walls and make sure that the, the cages are removed. Make sure the root flares are exposed. You can see here if you can see my cursor. Um, so at this point here, we're starting to see a little bit of the flare, and that's what you want when you're planting your trees. You don't want to plant this big mound of soil on top of it. What happens? You get girdling roots. Um, trees are dense, but they are porous. They need atmospheric, um, you know, nitrogen and um, other different gases passing through it all the time. So, you know, when you put that soil and mulch over the top of the root ball, you're essentially what you're doing is you're suffocating that tree. Um, could last a year, could last five years, could last 20, 20 years, but eventually that tree is going to give up the ghost because that root flare is covered, it has girdling roots and superfluous roots up the surface, and or they which makes them more susceptible to drastic changes in weather conditions, uh, typically buying out truck. Um, education and leadership is a huge part of this. Like I mentioned, AGS has been great. Um, I'm a NOFA, again, a NOFA um, accredited professional, so I took the NOFA class. Uh, our Rutgers course is fantastic. These can be all found online. Um, you know, they're, they're really good courses to take. Um, ELA also too has, has some very good uh, landscape plans. Um, and AGSA, get involved in your community and local industry associations. There's a lot of things happening in, your, in our industry um, about the things we're talking about that, that you can get, you know, you'll have plenty of information from folks that can gu help to guide you. So you're not going to be on your own doing, doing things like this. Um, myself and Dan are always open uh, for phone calls and emails and welcome those questions. Um, whenever we're doing these kind of webinars, we make sure that you, you folks are always um, know that we're available for your questions. Take your time, take little bites. You know, you have to take small steps in most cases unless you're a startup and you can take that leap and you're going gung ho. Um, Hard for companies to to make that transition from sometimes in big bites if they are a conventional a conventional company. Uh, um, so we are at the very beginning of what what I think is is going to be a, a big trend in our industry. So right now, what we're sort of looking at is our group uh, with AGSA and some of the other contractors to do the work like we do. You know, I think we're somewhere between the innovators and early adopters um, in this in this diffusion of innovation um, uh, slide here. So. You know, once you get into the rural majority, that's when more homeowners and things like that will start to adopt it. That's when more people will start to get it. But the early adopters, they really have to jump on it and get, you know, are able to get ahead of trends and set, be leaders in the industry is to, and, and sort of guide the way as to what we're doing. One thing you let, you don't want to do is you don't want to be the late majority of laggards. Um, those are the people that are going to be found behind and you know, you're bottom of the barrel for the contract. So, um, Real quick, I know I got to wrap up here. Dan's one to only get on. So the important thing is, can we make money? Yeah, we certainly can. Um, you have to be honest. You have to have integrity. Um, doing this kind of work will help you really pare down what you're doing and find out where you where you have better efficiency in your business. Um, you'll be able to market to people that are specifically looking for this work. You'll be competing on price, which is key. Competing on price is so much better than lowballing. Um, whenever you're lowballing, that's like the lowest common denominator. That's the last kind of work you want to get into. You want to be setting your bar high. You want to be doing high quality work and doing organic land care and doing these kind of things that set you apart as a, as a unique leader in the industry. People recognize that and, you know, your website and your marketing will reflect that and, and you'll be able to, you know, set your rates accordingly. Um, and it's quality, right? It's not quantity. You don't need to go out and cut 100 loans a day. It's a different business model. You have to flip that upside down and look at things differently. That paradigm shift has to happen, okay? Um, just to give you a little frame of reference on our company, we're small. Uh, five employees cur currently manage 45 uh, residential properties, all different sizes. Uh, we're definitely in a growth mode. Um, revenue's under a million this year, but we're looking to be over four to seven team members in, in eight to 12 in the next 10 years. And we are profit ranges 15 to 20. Um, revenue and profit are up because we haven't changed employees much, but we've increased our prices. Um, and, and we've obviously pared down some of the expenses that we don't need. And that, doing things like this help you find that out. Um, so the industry's changing. These are just some final thoughts. Um, and I'll get to Dan in one second. So we're changing. Folks that are on this call, which I appreciate so much, you guys taking the time. Dan, uh, the group that Dan works with, Dan works with Quiet Communities, NOFA, of course, Records. Of course, ELA and other groups like that. Um, here in New Jersey, the NJLCA and NJNLA are two local um, industry as associations are really 
really getting involved in this and, re and really want to take the lead and, and show that the industry, you know, show the industry that this is going to be something that's going to be a profitable way of running a, a landscape business and that folks are going to be able to do it. Um, and just real quick, I came across this quote the other day, and I think this is it's pretty pertinent to what we're talking about. Um, you know, you got to take small steps. You got to take those steps. And if you don't, you know, you're going to be left behind. So like I said, take small bites so if you have to. Um, but you definitely got to take that step. So I can I'm sharing now. And I will go over again. Second. Come on, Dan. Okay. Thank you, Rick, for the baton there. Okay, great. You're good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Off you go, Dan. Uh, hello, everybody. Dan Mabe with the American Green Zone Alliance. Uh, Rick, thank you for an amazing presentation. It is such an honor to share this platform with you. Ags of Values, what you do as a company and, and what you stand for. AGSA really wants everyone to learn the holistic view on sustainable land care. And it's not just replacing gas tools. And that is why uh, we're, we're seeking these collaborations and these partnerships. So uh, Rick, once again, thank you for a terrific presentation. I appreciate it. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and cue our, our uh, presentation up here. Okay. All right. Uh, so before we get started, uh, definitely want to do a little housekeeping because I want everyone to know uh, that it's not just AGSA that's, that's leading this movement. It's a collaboration of a bunch of different people and organizations. And I just want to do some housekeeping here and, and mention a few before I get started. Really need to do this. Of course, uh, Jamie Banks, Quiet Communities, who we run our, our Green Zone program uh, with and through, uh, South Coast Air Quality Management District, the Mo Better Group up in Sacramento, the California Air Resources Board, Sustainable Westchester, and in Oregon, we have Electrify Now, Quiet Clean PDX, and the Lake Oswego Sustainable Network, uh, Healthy Yards, uh, non-toxic communities in NOFA. I, I just want to say that we are now leading people on the West Coast uh, to the NOFA certification uh, because we just really feel it's important to complete that full circle of sustainability. Um, our AGSA uh, AFTC uh, field tested certified manufacturers, Ego Steel, who's Varna, uh, Mean Green Mowers, um, all of our green zone uh, certified properties. And then uh, finally, and last but not least, all of our hardworking AGSA certified service pro companies. Thank you for getting up every single morning and doing what you do. Um, we are AGSA, the American Green Zone Alliance. Uh, we are a leader in low impact strategies for the grounds maintenance industry. We want to prudently transition the industry to quieter, more sustainable practices. And some of the applications are commercial crews who service these institutional and residential properties. There we go. What's going on here? Okay. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, we have our green zone uh, certification program, that's property transition, our service pro certification where we work directly with men and women, the, the workforce of this industry. And then, as I mentioned, the, the, the tool platform testing. How did we get here? Well, there is an issue, uh, definitely gas leaf blowers. Uh, people have just basically had it. Uh, especially with COVID, we've been busier than ever, uh, have received calls, inquiries, how can I stop this noise going on in my neighborhood every single day? This movement is well, it's well, uh, it's real, it's well organized, and, and now becoming uh, funded. Um, I know from working in the gas industry from a very young, young age, preteen age, 
uh, and even having a gas company as a young adult. Uh, here's our top 10 impacts of gas operations. We have the noise, of course, uh, at the top and in the center. Of course, we know the emissions, uh, but lesser known things are, let's just say vibration. That is from using gas tools. Uh, that's for the workers. Uh, toxic solid waste component that results from maintaining uh, small gas engines cradle to grave. We'll focus on noise here uh, for the next few slides. This could be any one of us inside our house, outside of our house, in our neighborhood. Here come the gas crews. Uh, they can be across the street to the left, to the right. And this is uh, four or five days, sometimes six days a week, depending on where you live. That's what that noise profile looks like. And we all know what it sounds like, indoors, outdoors. If they were electric crews, this is what that sound profile would actually look like. I'm gonna uh, let you uh, hear what that sounds like in a couple of slides. But before that, it's important to know that hearing loss is irreversible. It's permanent, uh, but we can prevent it. Uh, most gas tools are going to operate at decibel levels, which the EPA, NIOSH, ANSI, and OSHA deem uh, unsafe working environments. And that's why we have to wear that hearing protection when using those tools. Uh, and then most electric tools are going to operate just uh, below or up to that threshold. We still recommend hearing protection for electric tool use because you're at the source. With that being said, there's a frequency component uh, that we're all learning about. Uh, gas tools operate at low frequencies that travels long distances, penetrates barriers, um, and then electric tools, high frequency. Uh, I learned this uh, from Joy at Cha Cha. She uses the mosquito analogy. It, it's very close to your ear, you can hear it, but as it moves away from you, that noise profile drops off significantly. Uh, here's an example of that. Uh, we are filming this Ego right on mower. You'll see when I'm close to the mower how uh, the sound profile is. And then once I distance from it, you'll see how it drops off. Okay, uh, not only are we doing training sessions here, first time users on this Ego Z, we're also continually testing these tools for their commercial viability in these unique situations. Here you can see this is an HOA. They value quiet. You see the size of this grass? Till next time, ags are raw. Okay, moving right along. Um, ags has been advocating uh, worker health uh, in, in, improvements uh, since our existence. We're finally glad to see that it's starting to be acknowledged and recognized uh, that the men and women uh, who use gas tools every day, um, their health could be impacted uh, by the exhaust and the emissions, as well as uh, people nearby. Uh, here are some of the solutions. Uh, this is an example of an 18 hole golf course. Uh, we green zone certified. Uh, Basically, we were able to cut the carbon out of these emissions by 70%, lower the noise profile 40 to 70%. We've done state parks. All of our projects come with uh, assessments, uh, ELF reports, we call them. Uh, we created this uh, with quiet communities. Uh, we generate these ELF reports, which stands for Environmental Landscape Footprint. We're able to measure uh, CO2 reductions, criteria pollution, uh, the noise profile, and even that solid and toxic waste reduction. Uh, just a, a quick snapshot on gas technology. Here's a diagram of an internal combustion uh, lawnmower engine. You see how many parts there are. And then these electric systems, uh, which you'll see soon, they basically uh, are comprised of a few components. You have the battery, you have controllers, and you have, uh, it powers the motor that runs the blades, the string or the turbines for the blowers. Uh, we're gonna focus a little bit on robotics today because we've had 
some great success uh, expanding our robotic green zone uh, uh, initiative. It's very exciting. Uh, we're doing this uh, right now with AOS and the LinkedIn group. And here's an example of a robotic mower green zone. As you can see, uh, all of the, the uh, stuff that is not um, being mowed is done with those electric tools, the hedge trimmers, the blowers, and the string trimmers. What's very unique about these systems is where you cannot get power, they now have a, a turnkey solution where we can charge these robotic mowers with solar panels. And here's another example of another property where we do this. Um, that right there is going to be the backup uh, battery uh, and storage with a built-in inverter. And then here's a quick little video on what the system actually looks like when it's functioning. Here is the auto mower beta test going on on this very large property. And it just docked, it's tired, it needs a little nap. <laughs> and guess what? <clears throat> this is all renewable here. This solar panel is charging this storage battery here. There's a built-in inverter, and then it's powering and charging the two units that you see here. How long does it take to charge? Um, you heard that question, how long does it take to charge? Those automotors you see there, once they're done uh, with once they're done with their mowing cycle, is which is um, I don't know. I think it's going to be maybe a couple hours. Um, when it comes back in to take its nap and docks, it it does take actually one hour to recharge those mowers, and then they go right back at it. It's a grazing uh, concept where they mow every single day and take micro cuts off of the turf and keep it at an even level. Um, it's less compaction on the grass and all of the clippings, those micro clippings are put right back into the uh, turf and soil to act as its own fertilizer. Um, as far as the workforce, it's very important that we do not demonize these folks that are just really trying to keep our properties uh, looking good and, and keeping our property values high. They just need to be educated, just as, as uh, Richard had, had mentioned. This is where we really feel uh, we're making the biggest change, uh, winning over the, the minds and hearts of the workforce, empowering them with very valuable information. And once they find out uh, how they can improve their health and working conditions and, and not have to compromise uh, and still deliver the, the aesthetic uh, that people expect. It, it's really helping accelerate this. Uh, here's a quick uh, video of, and, and, and we call these ags a raw. Uh, we, we don't glam anything. We just go out there and then we're gonna show you exactly what's happening in the field. I just want to say, uh, before I play the video, we were not happy that they took off the, the guard um, uh, down at the bottom of the shaft, and we really encourage all of them to wear uh, the proper eye protection. So we're still uh, really trying to stress the safety of things, but here's something that's raw. Maintenance crews here in Southern California, gorgeous day. Uh, you have LAPD's finest. All right, back over here. And you can see Angel here using this Boost Barna electric, commercial battery electric line trimmer. And as he moves away from us, uh, you can barely hear it. What's great is they're integrating and implementing electric tools on, on their routes. Not fully electric yet, but we're getting there. Okay, till next time, Ags are raw. Uh, if these guys can do it, anybody can do it. There is a training component uh, to this, though. Um, again, out there in the field, educating the workforce, the differences between gas and electric, 
uh, we tell them what to expect with work production uh, load capabilities and, and performance capabilities. And yes, sometimes they will have to modify the operations uh, to tailor it to their electric tools. These tools are lasting because they're listening uh, to the material, mounting their tools, not banging them around. It's very, very important. People say, aren't you just helping them press a button? No, it goes much more in depth than that. Uh, and here's an example. Our online certification course is in English, it's in Spanish, it's 15 lesson plans. It, it's very comprehensive, very thorough, and it really gives uh, folks who want to go in this direction, the foundation, they're going to need to do it successfully uh, without all of the pain points. Um, everybody receives certificates. And um, here's a situation uh, without certification. Uh, we do educate how to set up proper and safe uh, charging infrastructure. We give examples of uh, turnkey solutions like this TOA PDM that we're actually customers of and use ourselves. And then here's an example of a, a green zone uh, in Glendale, California, one of the charging bays. Uh, they use that green box. They only have to plug in to one circuit and there's eight plugs in the back of that box and it safely manages all of the loads and keeps them in the lowest tier of electricity draw, so they're going to get an ROI on those uh, batteries uh, a lot sooner. Um, paradigm shift, I heard uh, the term, uh, Richard used it. We all have to pitch in if there's uh, people from the industry or there's people uh, who are property owners on, on, the, on the webinar today. Please understand that we all have to work together and that our expectation of that plastic uh, landscaping really needs to change to that more organic and, and natural. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to compromise. And with that, uh, we want everybody to know they can go to sustainablelandcare.org if they want to uh, be enlightened and, and gain some of the knowledge that uh, we briefly described here today. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Richard, for that wonderful content. A lot of great uh, information here. And, uh, and if you did find uh, our content useful, we highly encourage you to visit our page, sustainablelandcare.org. Uh, this is our one-stop shop for knowledge, um, certification, online courses, and essentially all the tools you need to accelerate your transition on um, whether you're a property manager or training your crew. Um, there, like Dan said, there are a lot of big changes coming up. Uh, blowers are being banned. Um, and it's really time to arm yourself with the uh, right information, um, the technical knowledge and um, the service pro certification will be, uh, will be open, will open up a lot of new opportunities. And so don't get left behind. Um, set yourself up for success, and I highly encourage you to uh, visit our page and sign up for one of our courses. All right, so having said that, let's move on to our Q&A. All right, first question from Joy. Do you see any benefits to having land care equipment being powered by hydrogen cells? Is anyone testing out equipment with uh, H cells? And that's that's to you, I believe. Sure. Yeah, um, we have not heard of that yet. I think if if uh, they were going to start to dabble in that, uh, it would be for the much larger equipment. Uh, but uh, we we have not heard of um, that uh, technology powering lawn and garden tools yet. Uh, but when we do. Joy, uh, you'll be the first to know. All right, thank you for that, Dan. Next question, Dan or Richard, um, can you address the availability of batteries? I've been hearing that they're hard to get right now and the recyclability of these uh, batteries. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, there definitely is a shortage of components uh, that are needed to complete um, the manufacturing of the batteries. There's no doubt about it. Uh, with that though, uh, the industry has done an amazing job, especially through COVID and all of these other things happening right now. Uh, they've been able to uh, fulfill uh, a lot of the, the projects and, 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 and meet their, their, you know, their um, goals uh, and, and getting the equipment out there. There have been delays, there's no doubt about it. And, and we do see uh, some possible forecasted um, instability, but there's nothing definitive. Uh, people are still uh, really marketing their, their battery equipment. So we feel uh, based on what we see uh, that there'll be an adequate amount. And, and when things catch up, of course, um, we, we don't see it being an issue. And it's not just the lawn and garden industry. Of course, uh, these batteries are for the EV industry, which is huge and, and, it's, and it's growing, of course, our laptops, our cell phones. So definitely that's a great question. And we all really do need to keep an eye on it. As far as the recycling goes, um, I did I did not place those slides in today's presentation because I wanted to come in on time, uh, but we are repurposing used 18650 lithium cells and using them in different applications. Uh, one is with uh, a golf course mower at our green zone, um, uh, our green zone golf course. And there's a company called Big Battery, everybody, Big Battery out of Chatsworth, California. They are doing some amazing things, recovering all of these old scooters and, and, and um, uh, electric bikes, even electric cars and, and all these old cells. And they're testing and repurposing them and giving them a second life in a different capacity. It's, it's really happening, it's real time. We have a long ways to go, but we do know that repurposing is happening and it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a, a viable business model. And then we do know that there is starting uh, to be a business model for recycling lithium, but it's something we definitely need to be aware of and keep our eyes on. Thank you, Ben. Next question. Marlene, are the uh, trainings available in Spanish? Uh, yes, if you go to the Sustainable Land Care uh, website, we do have it in Spanish and English. And when we do our workshops, uh, we will bring uh, a bilingual uh, representative to help us with our live workshops as well, if requested. Great. Yes, just to confirm, 100% of our content is available in Spanish. So for Spanish speakers, they won't lose, miss out on any of the content. Thank you, Marlene, for that question. Next is Amy. Do you know of any grants that would help us get started? Uh, what state uh, are what what state are, are they in? Okay. Amy, if you want to maybe. Uh, NC North Carolina. Um, no, but there's some activity there. Not not immediately, but I will tell you we have been contacted uh, by some groups and and one governmental agency out of North Carolina. I think um, that's that's what a coincidence that is. I think that there there's something on the radar because they're coming to us with questions and asking about it. So definitely, if, if something comes up, we'll, we'll post it on our website or uh, uh, through our social media channels for sure. And I do have a follow up question then in regards to these grants. Can you um, give us more details in terms of which states are pushing this? Obviously, California is always taking the lead, but what other state have you uh, notice are really pushing this uh, and, and helping out with grants? Um, I mean, there's something in the works, uh, literally uh, in New Jersey, we just had a, a, a conversation about it. Um, it has nothing to do with regulation. It has everything to do with incentivizing and solutions. 
Um, I, I would say that uh, New York uh, just came out with something where they're offering uh, uh, $5,000 uh, to municipalities um, who could uh, use that $5,000 for a project where they would fund either Department of Public Works, maybe uh, some private operators, or run some type of gas for electric um, equipment exchange. So we're, we're seeing some activity in the Northeast. Uh, there's been whispers uh, in the Southeast, it, and, it's pri and we know that South Carolina has done this already. North Carolina's inquiring, and, and then also Florida. And, uh, uh, California is, is the leader on this, uh, but that's all we know right now. Great. Thank you, Dan. Now we have a question from Charlie. I'm in North Carolina. We're approaching our town to make the switch. Any ideas on how to best uh, sway them? Um, well, I, I, I just, when I meet with groups, I, I think that you should probably bring in people who have done this, uh, either AGSA or equivalent, uh, people who really know what they're doing. Uh, because, I mean, our, our, our latest um, AGSA Green Zone certification uh, was in Mountain Brook, Alabama. And basically, we have this issue. People want to bring it to the attention of the municipalities. But we encourage you to get in touch with us uh, to come uh, at least fundamentally prepared uh, before you're asking them to do this and, and maybe uh, find out how you would make the transition successfully. And we encourage you to, to make sure they know who we are and, and engage with us uh, should they be inclined uh, because we've been doing it a long time and, and we've, we were very experienced. Yeah, I could, I could add to that too. So um, non-toxic communities has a nice piece on their website along with AGSA um, that would, that can sort of guide you when, whether it be an HOA or going to municipality, um, if you go to the non-toxic communities website, you can, they have, if they call it a toolkit maybe, um, and that'll give you a way to actually approach people that, that make decisions, whether, like I said, whether it's HOA or your town, that'll, that'll give you some direction as to, as to people you can reach, um, directly. So yeah, non-toxic communities, their website's pretty cool. So. Thanks, Rick. Terrific. Thank you for that input, Richard. Yeah, I put that in check. Yep. All right. And it looks like that was my last uh, question.